Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I just want to thank Kate and uh, Microsoft for having me here today. Um, my name is Suresh Venkat. I'm at the University of Utah. And I want to talk to you today about algorithmic fairness. So I'm a computer scientist. And uh, as a computer scientist, the thing I do most of the day is think about algorithms. These algorithms do many things. I work on all kinds of different problems. But of course, many of the algorithms that I do look at tend to find patterns. They look for patterns in all kinds of data. And so the magical thing about studying algorithms for finding patterns for doing machine learning is that the same algorithm can, the same collection of algorithms can find patterns in many different kinds of data. And, and it's kind of interesting to see why and how that works. The same algorithms that you know, might tell me that I really should be buying this new first edition remastered, all new Han Din shoot first Star Wars edition, is the same algorithm that might actually decide whether I should get a loan for a car or not, as the case may be. It's, and even more scarily, the same algorithms that will be used to decide whether I'm a good citizen, as is rumored is, is going to happen in China over the next few years, where you have a credit score for a citizenship. And the reason these diff the same algorithms can do all these different things is basically a bit of magic. It's a magic that I like to call the, the shape of information. And it's a story that goes back, in some sense, about 500 years to Rene Descartes. The idea is very simple, that we, we what Descartes said you know, many hundreds of years ago was that if we want to describe shape, we can assign numbers to shapes. And by assigning numbers to shapes, we can go from geometry, the kind of geometry that you all learned in high school and beyond, and to algebra. And so by reasoning about numbers, we can reason about shape. And what we do, which I like to call the reverse Descartes trick, sort of is the thing that underpins most of data mining, which is to say, we take our objects and write them down as numbers, which is something that's fairly easy to do because everything is digitally encoded. And then we create a shape out of them. We put them in a space which gives them shape. And in doing so, we now say that our algorithms that want to learn things about us are shape finders. They're trying to find patterns in the space that correspond to things we want to learn. So you know, for example, you might have um, a collection of people, and you're trying to build a loan predictor. Should you give someone a loan, or you want to see, you want to predict sort of outcomes in life, as we just heard. So you have you know a bunch of points, and you might say, okay, let me label, you know, my train data with you know loans that were successful, and we'll call them uh, loans that weren't successful. We'll call them in red. Loans that were successful, we'll call them in blue. And of course, we do, what we want is a rule, some kind of guideline to say when a new person comes in, are they going to be successful or not. And of course, this is very binary, and you know, there are much more sophisticated ways of thinking about this. But just for now, bear with me. So your algorithm will think and think and think, and it might come up with a rule, a rule that can be expressed in this geometry that we've created from the data as, say, a line or a high dimensional line, if you wish, a hundred or a thousand or a million dimensional line. That's easy to think about after a few cups of coffee. So. Um, and it says, OK, if, if I take a point and I put it on one side of this line when a new person comes in to apply for a loan, then I'm, not, I'm going to deny them the loan. And if they are on the other side, I will grant them the loan. And at some level, it's essentially how all machine learning algorithms work. They construct these rules in these, in these strange spaces using strange geometry. And, and that's how they make decisions. And it looks like magic to us, because it looks like they really know something about us. But that's what they're doing. And of course, this is all well and good, as long as the world looks nice and nice and nice and clean. But of course, no world is ever as clean as all this. And of course, you might have something like this. You might have points that are not, that you discover do not fit uh, on your rule. So you have some more train data you got from a different source. And you say, oh, oh no, this is a wrong training rule that I've had. And I've maybe been misclassifying all this time. And so you somehow have to adjust what your rule is doing. And that's good, because now you discover there's another point that you should have misclassified one way, but you actually classified the wrong way. Now when you change your rule, you've learned a better way of doing it. And so, I guess what I'm trying to say is that algorithms make mistakes. And they make mistakes that are hard to discover because they're working in these very high dimensional spaces. And you know, this is probably not surprising to anyone who has small children and you know, wonders why Netflix insists they should be watching the third season of Pokemon Black or White. 
Um, not that this ever happened to me, but, but, but there are more insidious problems with these algorithms that are harder to detect. I mean, it's one thing to make recommendations that are lawfully wrong. It's another thing, for example, and this is a thing that you may have heard of, came out a couple of years ago. It's one thing for the software in a camera, speaking of listening or seeing devices, to decide that because you're, it, ha it is trying to detect helpfully, it thinks, whether your eyes are open or closed when it's taking a picture, and clearly has not been trained on the right kind of data to make a correct determination. It's not fun when a browser ad placement algorithm, and this is again research that was done this year, decides that whether you're male or female, it should decide what kind of ads you get, get shown, and the ads can have actual, well, consequences, are not just you know, insignificant in their differences. It's a problem when, again, in you know, an ad place, I'm not picking on Google, this is true for many of these sort of companies that do this kind of thing, decides that because your name has a certain ethnic flavor to it, maybe we should ask you if you, have, if you need you know, a bail bondsman or if you need to go into drug rehab, or you know, even if you happen to be you know, um, working at the FTC and a professor at Harvard. And the, the, when, I, when, when, we, when we worry about algorithms making predictions that are wrong in, in profound ways, the usual response that comes in, well, you know, an algorithm is after all just a recipe. It's a set of instructions. This is the, the cant that we've been told for years and years, and I've done this myself. I'm guilty of this. You know, it's a set of instructions. You open the recipe book. You read the instructions. The algorithm follows the instructions. So really, the problem is that if you have a whole lot of code that's doing something you don't like, all you have to do is go find the piece of code that says, if person, race, is ca not Caucasian, do something bad. And then all your problems will be solved. And sadly, of course, this is not the case. And this is not the case for a very fundamental reason, that while in many, many algorithms we do use our recipes, the algorithms that run PowerPoint are, well, I hope, are a recipe and not using internal machine learning. Machine learning algorithms themselves are really recipes for making recipes. And what I mean is that these algorithms work by searching a very large and complex landscape, this million dimensional bumpy space that I mentioned earlier, right? For a single answer, and, this, and the answer they get is the recipe that then becomes the procedure they use to decide, make decisions. So imagine you know, taking a ball and throwing it into a 50 dimensional roulette wheel. Not this nice one here, but a much one. And it kind of goes bouncing around fairly randomly, and it stops somewhere at some number, say 23. And the algorithm says, okay, 23. What algorithm does 23 represent? That's the recipe I'm going to use to make decisions. And that's all very well till you realize that you really have no understanding of how the training procedure, the machine learning algorithm, the recipe for making recipes came to this process. It came to this conclusion. And even if you did have any understanding of what it did, the outcome it produces is not necessarily interpretable. Algorithms are inscrutable, especially deep learning algorithms that we've been hearing a lot. You know, if I give you a rule that says, this is the formula that decides whether Amazon should recommend new shoes to you and it's a little bar thing, here's something you might be interested in. Yes, it's a rule. Yes, it's well defined. Yes, you can look at it. But does it tell you anything? No. It doesn't tell you why. And that why is part of the problem because we are assuming these algorithms have decision making power over our lives. And we want not to just to know that they tell us what to do, but we want to know why they're saying so, whether they're doing something wrong, whether they're making mistakes in the process. It's, can we debug these things? And it's very hard to debug something like this. And that brings me to the research that I work on, the area that is, uh, it's a growing area, and I, I, you know, I, I should say that you know, it's, I'm not the, neither the first nor the only one working on this. It's been around for a while. In fact, one of the original inspirations for thinking about this was, in fact, the article that Kate and Dana Boyd had written some years ago on, on uh, I forgot the name, six, I forgot the name. Provocations. Six provocations for big data, thank you. Yes, it's a very nice article. And w these, because algorithms have the power not just to decide where we eat or sleep or watch, but also decide where we go to school, where we get jobs, you know, what kind of world we see through our, through our phone-sized devices, how they filter information through to us, and whether even our freedoms can be taken away from us. And that's a very, much, a very serious thing. It's important to understand how they work and whether they're being fair in what they do. In particular, do algorithms discriminate? Can we detect whether they're discriminating, especially against groups, unprotected groups, minority groups, groups that have been dis historically disadvantaged? When you think of algorithms being trained on past data, we know a lot of that past data is problematic. Are the algorithms merely reflecting and amplifying those biases? 
we talked about, we heard earlier from Tim about you know, the trade-off between moderation and privacy. There's a similar tension here between privacy and fairness. You, know, you want people's information to be private, but when you have privacy, it can be a shield for doing unfair things. How do you balance these issues? And it's something we don't really understand how to do. Can we retrain algorithms to be fair? You know, if we want to build new algorithms, we want to we you know, new weapons that we've been using, can we actually make them fairer by instrumenting them in certain clever ways? And fundamentally, since after all, algorithms are all mathematical constructs. Can we translate the notions of fairness and social justice that have been you know, handed down to us for generations into a language, a mathematical language, if you wish, that can be programmed into these algorithms so that they can themselves can, can learn what it means or even know what it means for something to be fair? So just a, a final note. So there's a lot of talk about our machine overlords. And you know, the, the general conception of our robot overlords, the worst, the most scary one is of course HAL. You know, the utterly indifferent, supremely powerful machine that just swats us away like a fly. And in many ways I think, you know, we try to console ourselves by thinking, no, the machine overlords are not like HAL, but they're more like Skynet, to whom we are so important that they have to hunt us down and kill us. So you know, it's maybe not much of a consolation, but it makes you feel a bit more important anyway. What we'd like, of course, our algorithms to be are, you know, Mr. Spock, right there always logical, always calm, always reasonable, never prone to anger, but always losing the argument to the emotional Captain Kirk. Right? That's how we want them to be. But as I said, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I work with data, I work with machine learning. And to me, I think when I deal with these algorithms, the, the, image, the right image that comes to mind is really a two-year-old. They're inscrutable, they're temperamental, they're capricious. You don't want to give your two-year-old the reins to power, not, not really. But they can be trained, they can be educated, and maybe one day even given a modicum of responsibility to make them a grown-up algorithm. And that's my research and what I hope to do with this work in fairness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ooh, thank you so much, Suresh. I'm going to project my voice until we have uh, a microphone working. There it is. I know lots of people in this room are working on these issues in, in, in machine learning and also in broader questions around discrimination. So I'm going to throw straight to you questions from the audience. Here's two. Wonderful. Dan. So one categorization that's been made is between algorithms that integrate and weigh all available information and those that proceed one piece of information at a time. So they try to make a decision on one feature, and if that doesn't work, they go to the next, and they go to the next. And they generally end up having two nice properties. One, they use a third of all available information, whatever that is. And two, you can write down what information they're using. And you can actually tell them to guess if they run out of features. So it seems like in those cases where you know what the features are, you can at least you know, use algorithms that tend to be as good as those that integrate all available information but you can also be transparent about what features are being used. And one, one direction, one important direction in the larger space of algorithm defense is exactly that. How do you build interpretable models that are <laughs> as powerful or maybe nearly as powerful as methods that aren't interpretable, but then you can actually write down the answer of what they're doing, which is very helpful. One of the issues that we've found, and that is sort of a common problem in this area, is that it's it's not even sometimes, sometimes it is the, the fault of the algorithm or, or the need to make it more transparent, but sometimes even if you do have an effective algorithm, the training data you supply to it and the metrics by which the algorithm decides whether it's doing a good job or not are what can introduce bias into the system. So for example, you know, a simple example of this is that most machine learning algorithms are trained to say, how many times do I get the answer right on the training data, you know, test accuracy, training accuracy. And if you have a population that is not well represented in the training data, then the algorithm can afford to make huge mistakes on the small population, and will do so in order to optimize really well on the rest of the population. Now imagine that small population is, say, female applicants at a tech firm, and the larger population is male applicants. Now you have an algorithm that, that systematically discriminates against uh, women when it comes to looking, doing hiring processing for tech jobs. And so while I think it's important to have algorithms that you use that are transparent and you can look at the rules, this kind of problem is, a, is another problem that you have to deal with when you're dealing with albums as well. So I think they're both important, but I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. Yeah. So, um, so this obviously sort of comes up a lot in my work, yep. and uh, going back to the work in the workplace, 
Uh, so a reporter from the New York Times said, you know, this is very scary. You're taking this out of the hands of the recruiter, which isn't actually true. It's a, with ours was a tool for right. them. Yeah. But recruiters have been studied. They look, they give you five seconds and look at three details on your resume, your name, your university, and your last job, all of which, to review, are at best weekly predictive and largely not predictive at all. Right. We looked at 55,000 variables. Yep and then fed that to them to make hopefully a better decision. And we've done a lot of other things like that. So I, I have this concern that people have this idea of, and believe me, I'm, I'm not a believer that algorithms are perfect or that they should be allowed to be autonomous, or at least not right now. Um, I'm not a techno-utopianist, but there's this idea that somehow, magically, having a person in a loop is inherently a good thing uh, in the sense, I think in the well-meaning sense that I had one great teacher and now you're gonna take away that teacher's ability, which one while not being true also says, well, that's great. Can that teacher handle the next billion kids that come along? Because that's all I really wanna do is give them that sort of chance. So what has been your experience in, in dealing with the issue of the ideal of sort of human existence versus what, what sort of benefit can be provided, just say marginally, if we can improve things by 20%. Oh, completely. And, and, and I, I should clarify, yes, the, the, the idea is not to be absolutist and say that, you know, algorithmic predictions are bad. The, the question is, and, and again, from, from where I come from, I see a, more of the, the techno-absolutism that maybe you, you've been are dealing with, is that there is a tendency to assume that everything can be done by algorithm predictions. And, and the problem I think there is, as, as you just said, is, is that you know, you, you, that's also a problem in its own right. You want to augment, you don't want to replace. So I think the, the goal of the research that we're doing is not to say that you, know, you should not be using algorithms at all. The goal is to say, how have, it, we, we, we understand at least to a degree the way humans have biases and the way they look at things. Let us understand the way in which algorithms have biases and they look at things. And as we move towards this augmented data society, can we make sure we don't forget about all the fact ways in which algorithms can produce bias and have ways of instrumenting them so yeah. they don't do that? But I completely agree with that point. So we ha there has to be a balance here, yes. So this is sort of a meta question based on a lot of the, of the entire panel. So it seems like a number of you invoke these kind of early modern uh, analogies or allegories. So Kircher with the listening machines or Hobbes Leviathan or Descartes analytic geometry. And I'm just wondering, like, what is it about? It seems like there are just huge historical intellectual issues that are being touched here under the surface with things like, you know, the delegitimation and irrelevance of the state as being like an actor that can sort these things out for us. The impossibility of like public reasoning about algorithms, that we actually don't understand this data well enough to sort of talk and deliberate about it. The, the social contract and the means of production being replaced by the terms of service. Um, Silicon Valley capitalists and engineers replacing sort of like the merchants and lawyers of the Hanseatic League in the sense that like it's their values and ideas and that are kind of dictating what the, the sort of ideology is. So I guess like one of the things I'm wondering about is like do we have to sort of throw that history out and start over? Like is that no longer relevant? Can we learn something about how the people in those times, 16th, 17th centuries, like dealt with the times of crisis? Is it something where we have to, as you were saying, like sort of teach the machines how to recognize like these traditional values or sort of lead into the ways that they're disrupting those values because some of those were not actually like great paths for us to take as society. So I don't, oh, that is an enormous like <laughs> thing, but it's something I see like all, like yeah. all of these talks kind of getting at. And yeah, I'm just wondering, what do you guys think about like modernity? <laughs> <laughs> Slam dunk, Tim, woo! <laughs> Uh, that is, it's so true, and can I just say, as a complete second, the more work I do in this space, the more we are taken back to these early presumptions around how modernity models the social world, because we are both replicating it and creating enormous yep. gulfs there. So, Suresh, bring us home. Modernity, what do we do? Okay, answer, answer this whole question in two seconds. Though. You got two seconds. Okay, let me think. Okay. So, 
and I, I'm sure others will have many, many more things to say, but I think what we're seeing, as always, is that it's the same old story expressed in a different platform. It's about power. It's about who has power. It's about you know, uh, well, unmediating and changing the way we think about sort of power. The problem with technology, of course, is that it has created amplification. In many ways, I guess, the Renaissance era was an era of amplification in the way people talked about knowledge so, you know, with, 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 the Guten, with Gutenberg, with the printing press. We're seeing the same kind of amplification here. And I think that amplification combined with you know, the rise of computer science and a way to understand amplification is what's making us think anew about these ideas. But yes, they are not new ideas at all. And sometimes it can be frustrating to sort of say, you know, yes, people have been talking about this for 100 years. It is your new little idea is not the newest thing in the world. But, but yes, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, I think modernity is where we are right now. It was, you know, the Renaissance was modern when they were doing it as well. It's just a question of understanding how the old and the new interact and what is specifically different, which I do think is data and amplification. Yeah.